available uh, in the links provided in uh, the chat box. And so while uh, these spaces tonight are, are virtual, uh, they would not be possible without the use of resources and energy uh, that come from Indigenous territories. Uh, so in my case, my internet cables um, are uh, through the unceded and unsurrendered territories of the Algonquins and Anishinaabe peoples. And so we really wanna start off uh, by paying respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We also want to acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains to this day unceded. We pay respect to all indigenous peoples in this region from all nations across Turtle Island who call Ottawa home. And we acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. So a couple technical points before we get started. Uh, so the first is that we're gonna ask everyone uh, to stay muted. Um, I'm not sure you even have the option to unmute yourselves, but just in case you do, please don't do it. Um, we have a large group of people tonight. Uh, and so we welcome you to post questions in the chat um, and we'll be compiling those together and there will be time for a Q&A following both uh, presentations. Um, if you require translation, si vous avez besoin de la traduction, uh, il y a une fonction en Zoom. There's a function in Zoom uh, qui se nomme interpretation, interpretation. Donc, il faut juste cliquer sur le bouton uh, et sélectionner votre langue, donc uh, le français, français à l'anglais, uh, et il y aura la traduction uh, pour uh, la conférence ce soir. So with that, I will introduce uh, the first of our two speakers. Uh, so we have two wonderful speakers joining us uh, this evening, uh, Christy Belcourt and Starhawk. Um, so they will both share with us some uh, words of wisdom, um, and then we'll have uh, the Q&A portion uh, at the end to kind of bring both conversations together. Uh, so I'm first gonna introduce uh, Christy. So Christy Belcour, mischief from the Métis community of lac saint anne Alberta, is a visual artist, environmentalist, social justice advocate, designer, and avid land-based arts and language learner. Her work is found within many public gallery collections across North America. She was named the 2014 Aboriginal Arts Laureate by the Ontario Arts Council, and in 2016, she received both the Premier Art Award and a Governor General's Award for Innovation. As a designer, she has collaborated with the House of Valentino in 2015-2016. In 2015, she designed the medals for the Toronto Pan Am Para Pan Am Games. She has also worked in collaboration with many companies to create products with the proceeds of all her work donated to Nimki Abazinikon, which is a year-round Indigenous language and traditional arts camp that she, along with a group of people, started in 2017. The camp is committed to the revitalization of Ojibwe language, along with providing opportunities for elders and youth to come together in a land-based learning environment. In 2009, her work as the lead organizer, as a lead organizer in the Willisville Mountain Project helped save a mountain from a mining company. In 2012, she began the seven-year project Walking With Our Sisters, a commemorative installation to honor the lives of murdered and missing indigenous women, which just wrapped up last year after touring over 30 locations across North America. In 2014, she started working with Isaac Murdoch and formed the Ananun Collective. Together, their work combines social activism, environmentalism with land-based activities, and their artwork has been silkscreened onto thousands of banners across North America, Turtle Island, seen many uh, climate and water protection activities. Even though she is a prolific visual artist and designer, Christie's work as an activist in environmentalism, social and community-based justice is the work that takes up the majority of her time, and it is the life work that she feels is most important. So with that, I would like to welcome Christy. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that really warm and beautiful welcome. Uh, it, makes, it almost makes me feel um, like <laughs> intimidated, I guess, <laughs> by such a huge list. And then I wonder, well, where is my life gone if I've been working so hard? <laughs> you know? But uh, I want to thank you, Amanda and, and Julie, uh, for, for this uh, you know, invitation and uh, to be on this panel with uh, you, Starhawk, is a real honor. And um, I wanted to tonight, I suppose, present a little bit, uh, you know, of my thoughts along. Uh, I was asked to speak about climate justice. And so there's uh, many areas that I could go with it. Um, 
but I wanted to also, I think, uh, just show a few slides at the same time as I'm talking um, to get the imagination going while the words are coming out of my mouth. So I'm going to share my uh, this PowerPoint presentation, which is uh, just a few photos and things like that. Now, let me see how I can get this going here. Slideshow. There we go. Okay, so I will begin. Christy Belcourt, Mitzi Katson, Manitou Sakaikin, Oche Mia, Nimkiajabikong, Ekwa, Espanola, Nuigan. My name is uh, Christy Belcourt, as you know. I am Michif. I come from the Michif people, who are Cree speaking people of Black Saint Anne in Alberta. I'm a mother, a daughter, a cousin, an auntie, and hopefully a future grandmother. I live in Anishinaabek territory along the north shore of Lake Huron at Nipiagebekong and in Espanola. And I've lived along the north shore for 20 years, raising my daughter with her Anishinaabek family. I have lived in Anishinaabek territory uh, my entire, almost my entire 54 years on this earth. I have immense respect and love for Anishinaabek people and their lands. I'm going to speak tonight about land, about the sacredness of land, the sacredness of water, the spiritual fabric we live in on this beautiful, living, breathing planet in an endless universe that is the great mystery. I love the idea that some things are not known and that we exist in this great mystery that, and that we don't need to know everything. The fundamental truth of existence is that human species rely on everything else on this planet to survive, and nothing aside from our domesticated pets need us to survive. As an artist, I naturally see in my mind's eyes pictures. I often try and picture the whole world at once. I see Mother Earth as a moving, living ball of life that is alive herself. She is breathing, she changes, she grows, she births, she buries, she has spirit. And spirits exist in her and live here with us in the rocks, in the waters, in the forests, and they make their homes in the forests and the secret, in the secret places that few know about. I wonder what the whales are doing while the cars are driving. I wonder what the beetles are doing in the soil as the wolves care for their young and the young person reads a book at a bookstore and then walks down the street to meet their friend or perhaps goes to care for an ill relative. We are all moving, changing, birthing, dying, all at the same time. Simultaneously, these moving parts make up our whole. We are truly one. We are truly all connected. What I see in my mind's eye as I go about my day is also all those who are keeping me alive on this planet, busily working away are the insects, the animals, the plants, the microbes, the plankton, the fish, etc. within the ecosystems that sustain our world and sustain us. I exist in a state of humble gratitude. They are our life support and their places of existence are their homes, their territories, and our voices in defense of their rights is vitally important at this juncture of earthly existence. In the, the grand mistake of our human consciousness throughout history on this planet was to think that we own the earth and to put up imaginary borders where flags were planted. The climate crisis did not begin with the Industrial Revolution. It began long ago when human species began to follow leaders who told them that humans had dom dominion over the earth and, every, and anyone else who was not like them. White supremacy and the belief of human supremacy over the planet has very long roots and before I go on, I want to address the word resources. It's a word that I detest 
but am forced from time to time to use when I'm talking about Indigenous issues and environmental justice. So I add this disclaimer first before I continue, that the word resources to, to describe parts of the earth eventually will need to be eradicated from our vocabulary as a human species, uh, as a human species, as the world itself, the word resources itself implies a dead planet and is tied to the insatiable growth of the capitalist system. Now that said, when trying to understand climate justice and how it relates specifically to indigenous peoples, we need to start with acknowledgement of the basic truth. Indigenous lands all over the planet were stolen for the resources, and that includes all of Canada. Indigenous peoples have been murdered and displaced for the resources. Indigenous people continue to be murdered and displaced for the resources. Inch by inch, through force, genocide, coups, intentional poverty, and enacted laws by colonial governments, Indigenous peoples are in a battle for our lives and lands every single day on this planet. Let's take a look at some modern examples. The recent failed attempt at the US-backed coup in Bolivia was for the resources. As President Evo Morales, who returned to Bolivia joyously, I'm so happy about that this week, he said that the coup was an or orchestrated uh, plan to gain access to the lithium where indigenous communities are. He also has said previously, capitalism, and the thirst for profits without limits of the capitalist system are destroying the planet. Climate change has placed all of human beef, has placed all of humankind before a great choice to continue in the ways of capitalism or death or to start down the path of harmony with nature and respect for life. In Ganesatage territory, the fight against the Canadian colonial system for the protection of their lands continues. In 1990, the resistance at Ganesatage was fought because the town of Oka wanted to build a golf course on Mohawk lands. Today, the people of Ganesatage continue to fight to protect the same lands, which are now being encroached upon by a housing development 30 years later. At Six Nations, 1492 Land Back Lane has recently been in the news once again because the housing developers are trying because housing developers are trying to encroach upon Mohawk lands. This theft of Mohawk lands has so far been supported by Canadian governments, courts, and the police. The Mohawks who are trying to protect their lands are being arrested and face violence by the Canadian state. In Wet'suwet'en territory, the BC government and the BC RCMP moved in violently to remove the indigenous people from their lands so that CGL, a natural gas company, could build a pipeline through Wet'suwet'en territory without the free prior and informed consent of the people. In Sepwet'en territory, another pipeline is being violently forced through the lands threatening wild salmon species at the head of the Fraser River. In this case, the Canadian government even went so far as to purchase the Kinder Morgan pipeline itself, using $12 billion of taxpayers' money to do so. Now renamed the Trans Mountain Pipeline, there are camps of Sepwetmuk people who are trying to stop this pipeline at great personal risk to their own safety at the hands of violent settlers and police. On Mi'kmaq lands, on many fronts in Nova Scotia, the Mi'kmaq are fighting for protection of their rights and also for their water. We have all seen recently how Mi'kmaq fishers have had their lobster pound burned to the ground and faced death threats and violence while white mobs in Nova Scotia were supported by the RCMP police. The Mi'kmaq at Pictou Landing First Nation have been fighting for 52 years to get the pulp and paper mill to stop dumping pollution into their water. Whole generations have been victims of environmental racism there. At the Shubenacadie River, Mi'kmaq grandmothers have organized to stop Alton Gas from dumping brine into the river. Police have been brought in several times 
to support the state and to support the polluters. In Northern Ontario, a small group of Anishinaabe grandmothers have organized to take on the giant nuclear waste management organization, the NWMO, to try and stop the uh, deep geological repository from being built on Anishinaabe lands where they plan to build, bury the most dangerous nuclear waste that exists on the planet. The MN, N, NWMO is an arm of the Canadian government and is supported by taxpayers' dollars. And I think that this is something that we all need to pay attention to because this nuclear waste that they're planning on burying in the deep geological repositories has a shelf life of 100,000 years, meaning that if it leaks and get into the, gets into the waters, we're talking about a possibility of uh, maybe the Great Lakes and or maybe um, uh, you know other waterways being completely uninhabitable, toxic, un unlivable for an unfathomable amount of time of a hundred thousand years. That's that's something that we can't we can't even think five hundred years ahead or a thousand years ahead, let alone a hundred thousand years. This is the most toxic substance that exists on the planet. And so when people start to talk about green technology, green energy, and they put nuclear energy in the, in the pocket of that or the file of that green, green sort of category, it's absolutely not true because they're not, when people talk about um, nuclear energy as being green, they're not taking into consideration the energy that comes at the front end of nuclear energy, which is uranium mining. mining. So uranium mines uh, have caused some of the worst kinds of environmental destruction, including uh, death and suffering of many indigenous peoples where the uranium mines have, um, have existed and, and continued to this day. Um, they continue to suffer to this day, First Nations that have been impacted by uranium mining, including Serpent River First Nation, Northern Saskatchewan, in the States, in Navajo country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then on the other end, on the disposal end, they don't know what to do with the nuclear, the, the fuel rods once they're spent. And so their, their grand idea is, um, is to, to bury them deep, so deep into the ground that they're just hoping on a wing and a prayer that, that this doesn't leak and get into the water. And then they're pushing it off to the future generations who may not be, you know, in, if you think about this, a shelf life of 100,000 years. Uh, of being completely toxic. You think about that, what happens in 2000 years from now, if they leak, will the people who are living in the lands on the territories have the ability to understand that that's what we did in this generation? Or will they just be caught off guard? You know, it's, it's, it's just, I can't, it's not even thinkable what they're doing. In Algonquin Territory, the people there organized this year, this fall, to protect uh, declining moose populations, which were uh, noticed by their elders, uh, to call on a, a moratorium against hunting. Uh, and when they did this, uh, they were taunted by white hunters who shot at their signs and then threw body parts of moose. So they went hunting for moose and then they took legs and things like that and threw those body parts of the moose at, the, at or near their camps. And this was all supported by the police who refused to act um, and stop the violence of, of, these, uh, of these white people. So where we live in Nimkiajibikong, we've been trying to um, build a, a, a camp there to focus on language revitalization and land-based practices um, and occupying, believing that occupying the lands, returning to the, the land-based practices, our language, our ceremonies, and being able to do this in a way that's unbothered and uh, is integral to our ability to protect the waters and the lands. And these are just a few of the current examples of environmental racism and injustice that Indigenous people are fighting today as we speak. There are many, many more globally. Worldwide, most estimates are that there are approximately between 370 and 470 million Indigenous people globally spread out over 90 countries. We make up about 5 to 6% of the global population. 
but we use and manage about a quarter of the world's surface area and we safeguard about 80 percent of the world's remaining biodiversity as a result. The late Wilfred Pelche, my friend and elder, elder uh, and mentor once said, Indigenous people have never invented anything for the destruction of the earth. Indigenous knowledges hold key for survival for the planet and we are natural climate leaders as a result. I think about this and how if we are safeguarding 80% of the world's, world's biodiversity and occupying and managing about a quarter of the world's the, the surface of the planet, yet our lands are not recognized legally as belonging to Indigenous people. I think about how much safer the planet would be if they were. Even the World Bank, <laughs> the evil World Bank, cites improving, this is what they say, improving security of land tenure of Indigenous people, strengthening Indigenous governance, and supporting Indigenous systems for resilience are solutions to climate change. This is the World Bank. Because climate crisis is directly tied to colonialism and resource extraction, and because Indigenous peoples currently are the users of land more than any other people, Indigenous rights and Indigenous control over lands are the natural climate solutions the planet needs. As my friend Isaac Murdoch says, when Indigenous people are in full control of their lands, living on their lands and having freedom on their lands, we automatically assume the roles as climate leaders. Sometimes it's more prudent to use your time to plant new seeds rather than dig out old roots. And there's not much that I can do in 45 minutes to pack in what amounts to a lifetime of education on the land, Indigenous rights, education, I mean genocide, and why climate change is disproportionately affecting Indigenous peoples, or why Indigenous peoples are the leaders of the climate movement. If any of what I have said is unfamiliar to you, it's going to require you to do some major homework on your own. But there is one question I get asked every time I do a talk, anywhere on any subject. So even when I'm talking about art, <laughs> someone always stands up or writes in the chat, and I'm quoting here, what can I do as a settler to support Indigenous communities and issues? So I want to get that question out of the way right now before the Q&A starts, because it will inevitably be asked. My answer is there is a lot you can do, but the main thing is find ways to give land back to Indigenous people. Indigenous control over lands is, climate, is, is producing climate solutions. Find ways to give land back. Find ways for legal ownership of land to be given into the hands of Indigenous people. I know you're probably thinking, uh, like, yeah, right. <laughs> How can I, who has no land, struggling to pay my rent, lives in an urban city, give land back if I don't have any? Well, that, that's a legitimate question. But here's some things that, that, you, that you can do in support of every in support of that you can participate in measures to legalize the rights of mother earth there are people who are moving towards that bolivia was moving towards that under evo morales uh, support the rights of mother earth push for waters to be recognized as living entities with rights there are people who are also working on that so join in with them protect areas areas of species at risk in your own actual vicinity where you live fundraise and give to frontline land defenders. So those uh, examples that I gave of some of the actions that are happening currently in Canada right now, they, they need legal defense. They need funds, they need help. The money doesn't go very far, it goes fast, um, especially when you're just fundraising with little online Facebook auctions and you're trying to struggle that way and you're, you're up against multinational corporations with endless pockets. So fundraise for people. If you can't physically stand on the front line 
of a water protection action or a land protection action and be out there putting your body on the front line, then fundraise for those who can. Help and support those who can. Amplify, amplify their voices. Fundraise and buy land to give back. So there are a lot of Indigenous people who are living in urban centres who don't have access to lands. And so if they had access to lands that were either within the urban vicinity or, or outside um, in the region, they would use those lands to help, help their youth reconnect to their lands and languages or to land and languages and the spiritual practices of, of their people. So fundraise to buy land and to give it back. Push for those who are, who are leaving estates in their wills to give land back now before they go or as part of their wills after they're gone. So if people have land holdings, give it to, consider giving it to Indigenous people. Transfer of private land ownership, that would be the same thing, only you don't have to wait to put it into your estate or your will, you could do it any time. Push for laws to be changed to recognize the collective Indigenous land ownership. I think this is key. So right now, um, what's happening is land is not recognized uh, legally uh, within colonial frameworks as being owned by Indigenous people collectively. And it, they don't have the means or the framework in, for example, Canadian law to recognize lands as being legally owned by Indigenous people. Land is considered uh, held in trust for Indigenous people. So, you know, we need to change those laws in the future. Recognize the authority of Indigenous people in their territories. And this means like the full authority to make complete decisions. So can, Canada is kind of famous for saying that it supports the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, but it does not, um, it does not and has not adopted the portion of consent. So it will give you the free prior and informed information. But if in an Indigenous uh, community decides that they don't want to go forward with a, a destructive resource extraction project on their lands or in their territory, there is currently no means or mechanisms for them to say no. Um, and so having consent over projects on lands and territories is, is essential. Start to follow Indigenous laws and protocols within your territories where you live. And this includes in cities and towns. There are Indigenous laws and protocols that exist where you live. And so it's just a matter of researching and finding out what those are. Get to know the original place names of the places where you live or visit. Center Indigenous leadership and give your seat up at tables for Indigenous voices. And this is really important when we see on pundits on, on, on television um, going off on uh, Indigenous issues, there's rarely an Indigenous person there. When we see people talking about climate justice and those types of things, we need to be able to make sure that Indigenous climate leaders are at the table. Believe that the earth is alive. Believe that she has spirit. This is kind of really important. You know, you can do this and it doesn't cost you anything, <laughs> but, but you really have to believe it. I think that um, on a, talking about the spiritual fact about how things work on Mother Earth and my own belief system, it's, it's essential that, that we recognize Mother Earth um, for the living being that she is. We can educate ourselves by reading and listening to Indigenous voices and Indigenous climate leaders. Um, here's a big one. Fight white supremacy. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of huge, but this is this is really important for climate justice and to address the climate crisis. We must fight white supremacy. And if this is your bag, it's not mine, but it might be yours. Run for government or positions of power with the express purpose of changing laws to enter and and enter police forces so that you can refuse at the time when you're called upon to act in violence against Indigenous people in the protection of industry. So let me repeat that. Join police forces if that's your bag. And when you're called upon to be violent towards indigenous people to protect industry, industry's interests, refuse to do it. That, that is going to make a big difference. Organize, organize, organize. And lastly, pray and make offerings. And what are offerings, you might ask? 
those are gifts of values to you, value to you that are given to the earth in thanks. So special things that you might have that you hold dear to your heart, something that you made, something of your time and labor that is especially hard to part with. I, I've parted with many things that, that have been particularly hard to let go of. Something that you, you put your prayers into as you're making. Go to the land and water, go to the forest, the trees, a park, doesn't matter, and offer it there. Pray for the future generations, with, not with worry, but with gifts and petitions for Mother Earth, and ask the spirits here to help, to help us, because we sure need it. Fundamentally, these are the things that you can do to act right now, without waiting or feeling like you have. You as an individual is powerless, but they will not bring about climate justice on their own. For that to happen, Indigenous people who use 25% of the world's lands must be put back into full control of those lands. And this is a bigger fight than any one of us can do on our own, or frankly, that Indigenous people can do by ourselves. We must join forces as the human species. Indigenous people cannot be put on the back burner as an afterthought. The structures of capitalism disguised as democracy cannot stand. This doesn't mean communism or any such ism takes its place. Indigenous people have laws. We have laws that are thousands of years old and are not structured as A, B, C, one, two, three, in a nice neat little list or a linear type of mindset, but they are laws nonetheless. Get to know them. Ultimately, it's our thinking that has to ch change and an open-mindedness to a different path forward, one that is kind and caring, full of justice for all one that puts Mother Earth's rights at the center and that puts the health and well-being of future generations of all species as our only guiding principles for the decisions that we will take in the future. There is a lot you can do, but there's nothing that we can do by ourselves if we don't unite. We must ab abandon politics, the right or the left, and we must unite for the Earth. All of the issues of climate justice and the issues facing Indigenous peoples today stem from these long roots back to the doctrine of discovery and to white supremacy. And so to recap, here's, here's what we have to do. <laughs> Eradicate white supremacy, <laughs> get rid of capitalism, <laughs> and give all the land back to Indigenous people. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. Here's the thing. We aren't actually going to save the planet until we do something new. And that means that people need to have a worldwide awakening to accept that capitalism, capitalism has failed us and failed the planet. And I'm a realist. I, I know it's not easy, as easy as saying eradicate white supremacy, get rid of capitalism, and give all the land back to indigenous people. But it is possible. And as long as it's possible, there's hope for this world. Nothing is worse than someone being a Debbie Downer and saying things like, that's not possible. Let's not do that. It, it's going to take too long. You know, we need to keep the hope alive within us that all things are possible. And remember, we are living on a ball of water, circling a ball of fire in an endless universe all things remain possible and so that's my that's the end of my talk for today i i really thank you for for zooming in i guess zooming in is that what we call it <laughs> and listening this evening i thank you for the great honor of being given the platform to speak and share my thoughts. Uh, ultimately, I, I really do believe that Indigenous people need to have our land back and that we are the solutions that the climate needs. 
So I, with that, I thank you and I, I will mute my microphone and, and turn it over to you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. That, that was so rich and wonderful and there, there are so many things that I personally want to follow up with you on, but I'm gonna park it because um, we have another wonderful speaker and we will have time for questions um, at the end. So with that, we have our second speaker, Starhawk. Uh, so Starhawk is an author, activist, permacultural designer, and teacher, and a prominent voice in modern earth-based spirituality and ecofeminism. She is the author or co-author of 13 books, including The Spiral Dance, A Rebirth of the Ancient Religion of the Great Goddess, and the Ecotopia novel, The Fifth Sacred Thing, and its sequel, City of Refuge. Her most recent nonfiction book is The Empowerment Manual, A Guide for Collaborative Groups on Group Dynamics, Power, Conflict, and Communications. She travels internationally, lecturing and teaching on earth-based spirituality, the tools of ritual, and the skills of activism. In the late 1980s, Starhawk consulted on and co-wrote the popular trio of films known as the Women's Spirituality Series, directed by Donna Reed Cooper for the National Film Board of Canada. Goddess Remembered, The Burning Times, and Full Circle. The trilogy was in the top 10 of sales and rentals for the film board for over a decade. Starhawk and Donna Reed Cooper formed their own film company, The Lily Productions, to make documentaries on women and the earth. Starhawk is one of the prominent leaders in the revival of earth-based spirituality and goddess religion. She is a co-founder of Reclaiming, an activist branch of modern pagan religion, and continues to work closely with the reclaiming community. Her archives are maintained at the Graduate Theological Union Library in Berkeley, California. Starhawk is a veteran of progressive movements from anti-war to anti-nukes and is deeply committed to bringing the techniques and creative power of spirituality to political activism. She is a founder of Earth Activist Trainings, teaching permaculture design grounded in spirit with a focus on organizing and activism. Starhawk holds a BA in Fine Arts from UCLA. In 1973, as a graduate student in film at UCLA, Starhawk won the prestigious Samuel Goldwyn Creative Writing Award. She received an MA in Psychology with a concentration in Feminist Therapy from Antioch University West in 1982. She has taught in many Bay Area colleges and universities, including John F. Kennedy University, Antioch West, and the Institute of Culture and Creation Spirituality at Holy Names College and Wisdom University. She is presently adjunct faculty at the California Institute of Integral Studies. So with that, thank you so much, Starhawk, for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Amanda. And Thank you for the honor of inviting me to be part of this conference. And thank you, Christy, for that incredibly beautiful and inspiring talk and your short um, to-do list. I'm sure we can accomplish that um, by next week, if not by the end of the month. Okay. Um, I just want to describe what happened one day last summer when I woke up and the sky was dark and strange and reddish orange and I looked like it must be just before dawn or about six in the morning and I looked at my watch and it said it was 8 30 and I was like that has to be wrong and then was please goddess let that be wrong and I kept looking at it and it was not wrong it was the sky that had turned um, an apocalyptic color from all of the smoke of all of the fires that were raging in California I'd already been evacuated from my land and had managed to come back there were three or four fires very, very close to us, but we were very, very lucky and didn't actually burn this time. But this has become our life in California every fall um, is major, major wildfires and major, major disasters. So um, I want to just acknowledge that indigenous people have been on the front lines of climate change since the beginning um, 
and on the front lines of every struggle to preserve and protect our environment. And also to acknowledge that at this point, we're all on the front lines. There are no safe places to go to. Um, so the question becomes, what can we do about it? And, and I'm going to share my screen with you and uh, show you hopefully some hopeful pictures because I think one of the things that happens around climate change is we often become really despairing about what we can do. It feels overwhelming and it feels like so many parts of it are out of our control. Um, but actually, I think there is much that we can do on every single level. And part of it is about understanding where it comes from. And part of it is about understanding what the solutions are. It begins by deciding what world do we want? You know, do we want that world on the left that is flourishing and green and complex and alive? Or are we going to settle for the world on the right? Uh, as Christy was saying, the world on the left is the world of a living earth that we are part of. The world on the right is that world of resource and resource extraction. Um, it's a world that leads to incredible poverty uh, for people all over the world. Uh, it's a world of war and destruction. It's a world of more and more catastrophes uh, made worse by climate change, like uh, the flooding after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Uh, the fracking, the garbage and the waste that we produce. Uh, it's a world that is only maintained by a kind of power that really literally has its boot on the necks of women, of indigenous people, of people of color, um, of rural people, of people who are in any way in the way of that resource extraction. Uh, it's a world that's maintained by these interlocking systems, the isms of racism and sexism and ageism and all of the different ways that we divide people up and say, some people are the worthy ones. Some people are deserving of all the benefits of civilization and others are expendable, others are just filler. Um, it's the world of oil spills and tar sands and nuclear power. I'm really glad, Christy, you spoke about nuclear power. Uh, I just have one word, Fukushima, <laughs> which is still, you know, an accident that is not contained and not cleaned up. We've just stopped focusing on it in the news media. Um, but nuclear power and nuclear weapons are something that I've been uh, involved in activism around since the 70s. And um, it is that long lifespan, you know, that 100,000 years, it's inconceivable. You know, 100,000 years ago, Human beings were like barely even biologically human uh, that we think that we can make a mess that no one can clean up for that long a time. And Fukushima, if nothing else, should have shown us that these things cannot be contained. Um, the result is we're suffering from massive environmental disasters, from drought, and of course, here in California, the fire. Um, and there's a, uh, a proverb, I've heard it's a Native American proverb, but I don't know where, but it says, if we don't change our ways, we're gonna wind up where we're headed. And this is where we're headed. 
So what do we need to do? We need to think differently. And um, we need to think more like an ecosystem and less in these systems of expediency, you know, simple, simplified cause and effect, uh, simplified short-term benefits for the few. Uh, otherwise, this is where we're headed. And Bill Mollison, who is one of the originators of permaculture, this is one of my favorite quotes from him, um, something that the American political system has uh, made relevant just about every single day over these last few months. Evil is stupidity rigorously applied. So where does this come from? You know, Christy was talking about how far back this goes. And I think it goes back, you know, to our conception of how we, how we see value in the world. How do we see the sacred? You know, in Western culture, um, we're sort of taught that this is the image of the sacred. You know, sacred meaning what really sets our values as a culture, what's most important to us. Um, that to be sacred is something that's high and light and it's outside of the world, it's disembodied, it's transcendent, it's pure, it's not messy, you know, it's shiny, it's clean, it's radiant. And really, maybe this is what should be sacred to us. It's not so pretty, but it's an earthworm. And this earthworm actually is creating immense amounts of fertility on the, on the earth, um, creating soil, creating nutrition, taking, it can take pathogens, crunch them up and destroy them and turn your like human um, species into fertile soil. You know, this is a miracle worker. And what would the world be like if we actually appreciated the sacredness that is in these things we call low and humble? And if you think about it, you know, even in our language, you know, the we say something is low or something is dirty to disparage it. And yet, if it's not for the dirt under our feet, if it's not for the actual earth ourself, uh, we don't eat, we don't live, we aren't alive. So to shift our, you know, to do that little to-do list Christy presented us with, you know, get rid of capitalism and white supremacy, um, give the land back to indigenous people, um, we need to shift our way of thinking because it is that framing of the world that somehow value is disembodied. It's outside of the world uh, and the world itself is kind of a nasty, dirty, bloody, suspect place that I think allows us to disrespect the earth so deeply and to do the terrible things that we do to the earth and to one another as human beings. And um, again, I think we're really seeing that here in the United States in our political system now, um, you know, where we actually have uh, the guy in the White House and the party that supports him that seem to be fighting not just the other political party, but actually sort of fighting reality itself. They seem to believe that all they have to do is say something and that will make it so. If they don't, you know, if they don't like what climate change is telling us, just say it's a hoax, doesn't exist. If they don't like what we need to do about the pandemic, just say like, oh, we're going to get over it. It's going away. If they don't like the fact that they just lost an election, just say, no, we, we really won. <laughs> and most of us learn that that doesn't really work well for us by the time we're about five years old. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, we are uh, having to teach those lessons very clearly. 
and reality has this way of coming up and you know hitting you upside the head if you don't pay attention to it and teaching you some of those lessons and i think that is what we are seeing now as um climate change you know stokes the fires and the hurricanes and the droughts uh and the pandemics and all of the things that are challenging our comfort and our way of life um, so what does it mean to really embrace this idea what does it actually mean to believe the earth is alive and sacred sacred in the sense that it's important it's something you're willing to sacrifice for um, to you know to take a risk for to stand up for to give up some piece of your comfort or your profit for um, it means connecting and understanding that life is a web of life and that we are all embedded in that web and that's also true of our human connections that we can't just write off some group of people as the filler you know the ones that aren't important because we are all interconnected and that we what we do to one of us we do to all of us um, to counter this we need to understand language and framing and george lakoff is a thinker a linguist and a political uh, consultant uh, who's done a lot of work on this and how we frame things politically uh, and it's a quote from him that unless you frame yourself others will frame you the media your enemies your competitors your well-meaning friends so what is a frame a frame is a kind of overarching metaphor through which we understand the world again this metaphor that good is high and light and disembodied and evil is dark and dirty and down and low that's a frame and it's deeply embedded in our language in our ways of thinking uh, it's related to the way we view people who are light versus dark you know um, that men are conceived of as somehow being less embodied higher transcendent whereas women with our you know monthly periods our birth giving our all of that bloody messy stuff that goes with having a female body are somehow like dirty and low all of that again goes into our framing of our understanding of the world and Lakoff also talks about our political frames that um, the overarching frame is that the country is like a family and in that family you know there's kind of one frame that says well a family needs a strict father life is tough the world is hard it needs someone to make order and set the rules and you know not coddle people because you know that will make you weak and unable to stand on your own two feet and be independent and um the world is dangerous and you got to be tough and strong to stand up to it and it's a, a family's job is to toughen you up and make you fit for the world the other frame is that the country is like a family family should be a nurturing parent um, and he very clearly doesn't make it father mother because that strict division of gender roles goes with that strict father frame whereas the nurturing parent model um can you know that parent might be mother might be a father might be a a person who's transgendered or queer or doesn't relate to gender roles at all but does relate to those roles of nurturing and caring and uh, i would say you know in our recent elections joe biden is such an embodiment of that frame the whole story about who he is talks about you know his loss of his wife and child in a terrible car accident right when he was first elected to office and how much he's nurtured and cared for his two remaining sons um, whereas I think if you look at Trump you can see 
he activates that strict father frame in people, but he also is more of another frame, which I would call kind of like the um, the crazy adolescent. And um, in order to counter it, we have to really think about how we frame what we're talking about and what we're advocating for. So, for example, here in the U.S., we look at a mask and we say, okay, you could frame this as a health precaution or you could do what Trump has done and frame it as a political statement. And that has real repercussions in people's lives. That's why the U.S. is the worst in the world at dealing with this whole crisis um, because we have people refusing to do a simple thing as simple as wearing a mask to protect themselves and protect others. So you can even do this in your home life, you know? How do you frame a sink full of dirty dishes, right? Do you frame it as like, whoa, we were so tired last night from uh, demonstrating and advocating that we'll have to do the dishes this morning? Or do you frame it as you just left all those dishes because you don't care about me? So when we get to climate change, we often frame climate change as being about carbon numbers and too much carbon in the atmosphere. But I think we need to frame it as a symptom of dysfunctional eco-processes on a large scale, and as massive ecosystem degradation. So we know carbon dioxide emissions are in excess of the natural carbon systems you know, the Earth has many, many natural systems that function to take carbon out of the atmosphere and sequester it and use it in many, many different ways, uh, especially through photosynthesis of plants and decay. Um, but when that gets out of whack and out of balance, it's a symptom not just of, you know, our emissions, but of larger ecosystem degeneration. Because if we frame it that way, then the counter to it is massive ecosystem regeneration. So, um, which brings us to how do we do that? Permaculture is one of the systems. It's not the only one. It's just the one I happen to know most about and teach. And it's basically um, draws tremendously on the practices and the kinds of understandings and indigenous knowledge that people have had for tens of thousands of years. Uh, the understanding that we need to observe nature and work with nature and not set ourselves as above or against nature. Uh, and to do that, um, we do that as a system of ecological design we can create human systems that are modeled after na natural systems that can meet our human needs while regenerating the world around us. And that's the hopeful aspect of it. So permaculture has some core ethics. That we care for the earth, that we care for people, and that we can't separate those two. You can't really care for people if you don't care for the environment that supports us and sustains us. We can't really care for the environment unless we actually care for the people. We've got to do it on the basis of justice. And if we do that, then we can care for the future. And to do that, we have to share the surplus. We have to reduce consumption. Um, we have to take our fair share. So in permaculture, we're thinking about not just designing in the sense of making something pretty or putting one thing together or another thing, but about how do we actually design relationships, ways that people come together with plants, with animals, with each other. Um, where are the connections and the flows between things? And we have to honor the indigenous wisdom and be willing to learn from that. Um, and support the real indigenous struggles around land and around equity. Um, again, California, we have indigenous traditions here 
that go back tens of thousands of years, maybe even longer than that, of how people worked with fire uh, to not just manage the land. I mean, when we say manage the land, it sounds so instrumental, but to live in harmony with the land and to bring, you know, our human interactions to bear on the land in ways that created more biodiversity, more life, more habitat. And a lot of that was with fire, uh, with prescribed burning that people did uh, as a sacred ceremony uh, that people did at certain times of the year. And what that did was it helped protect the land. So when lightning came, like it did this summer, and set fires, um, the fires remained low, relatively cool. They could put themselves out. We didn't have the kind of catastrophic wildfires that we're seeing today. And there are many people now today working to uh, recover these traditions. So the land that I am on, my, where my wires are connected, is the land of the Kishaya Pomo in western Sonoma County. And uh, the Pomo and Miwok and other peoples who have lived in this land, again, for tens of thousands of years, uh, very much understood the patterns of fire on the land. So this is a plant called dogbane. Um, there's a wonderful indigenous elder named Redbird Willie who came and uh, has spoken to us and taught in some of our classes. And he tends a patch of dogbane in Santa Rosa, in one of the towns here in Sonoma County where um, two, three years ago, we had a major wildfire that actually came into the town and burned neighborhoods. And what he said is, well, you know, if you'd asked us, we would have said that place where that burned um, is our dog bane patch. And that's because dog bane needs fire. Uh, a lot of California plants do. It comes up after fire and it would be used for making um, cordage and making baskets. And we knew that when there's fires, fire is going to come that way. And they understood the, the interaction of the patterns of the winds and the patterns of the land um, and the patterns of the fire and knew how to work with that. And that's the kind of intimate knowledge of the land that we need to learn from and we need to recover. So to deal with climate change, first, we've got to preserve the pristine wherever there's some left, whether it's rainforest, old growth, whenever there's so little of that left in the world, uh, we've got to stand and protect it. And again, indigenous people have been on the front lines of those struggles in so many different places around the world and continue to be. Um, but the hopeful aspect of what we can do, we have too much carbon in the atmosphere now, but there are ways that we can draw it down and take it down and put it where it can do good. And where it can do good is in the soil, because in the soil, soil organic carbon is what we call humus. It's the stuff that makes the soil fertile. It gives the soil the ability to hold on to water. Uh, so we can take some of that excess carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turn it into that soil organic matter. And how do we do that? We do it in the way nature's done it for hundreds of millions of years, using this uh, miracle new machine called plants, right? uh, using photosynthesis and decay. Because in photosynthesis, plants take carbon dioxide, water, do this amazing alchemy, break them apart, and link that carbon from the carbon dioxide and that hydrogen from the water, put them together in a new way, and they give us carbohydrates, um, sugars, starches, the building blocks that become plant bodies and life, uh, and those things that we are always trying not to eat. But we have to eat them because everything ultimately goes back to them. So there are many ways that we can do this. 
from making compost to sheet mulch, which is kind of a uh, horizontal form of compost, uh, using our friend worms, our sacred animal, uh, making compost tea, uh, which is made for your plants, not for you to drink. I know Canadians like tea, but not the compost kind, right? Hugo culture, this building up of uh, basically you take downed wood and you bury it and cover it with soil and build big planting beds above it. And then that wood decays into a source of carbon for your plants and also helps hold on to water. Uh, biochar, taking charcoal, making charcoal in a low oxygen environment that preserves the carbon in the wood or the waste materials and also becomes an incredible soil amendment. Um, ways to rehydrate the earth, to slow the water, spread it, sink it. Uh, this is a big project in Tamara Eco Village in Portugal, where they actually created this human made lake to help rehydrate the whole valley. I could go on and on about these things, uh, and I do when we teach courses, but just to give you a sense, and all planting trees and perennial systems so we don't have to dig up the earth all the time um, and so we have you know trees which are tremendous ecosystem engineers and they pump water they create more moisture in the atmosphere they become stores of carbon um, growing our food you know some of it at least in food forests that mimic a natural forest uh, rather than, again, having to till the soil and create these monocultures. Uh, this is uh, the piece of land that I'm lucky enough to live on here in Sonoma County. Uh, No-till methods of growing vegetables, growing other kinds of food, again, that don't involve exposing the soil always to the air and tilling it up and turning it over, but instead finding ways to keep it covered and to keep it absorbing water, absorbing rain. Um, the holistic management, Alan Savory was someone who lived in what's now Zimbabwe, grew up there, saw the land degrading. And it's a long story, which I um, probably don't have time to tell you all right now. But basically what he began to understand was that grasslands, especially in dry areas, actually need grazers. They need the disturbance of animal impact in order to thrive and in order to um, not degrade. And that you could do this, you know, it co-evolved with like herds, like in the Great Plains, you know, herds of bison that were acting the way they do in the presence of predators. Um, staying bunched together and moving around really quickly. Well, you could mimic that with grazing. And these are just some examples of, you know, before and after. Um, moving cattle or moving sheep around in ways that mimic the way wild herds behave in the presence of predators. So something like a third of the land on earth is grassland and these kind of medium dry lands and if we could restore uh, the life and the health of these grasslands which is where desertification is taking place at a rapid rate uh, which contributes also to global warming and to climate change and to too much carbon in the atmosphere um, we can have a major impact on climate change. And again, the good news is that this is very, very doable. Um, far ranchers and farmers who do this process actually can have larger herds, can make more money, um, can regenerate their land more effectively. And this is also a social justice issue because, you know, of the world's poorest people who live on less than a dollar a day, something like 70% of them make their living from grazing and grasslands.
Uh, so again, probably, you know, a lot of us don't live on the wild range and aren't going to take up uh, herding. These were our sheep. Um, again, and you move them around with electric fences. Um, but they also teach us something about policies we can advocate for. Uh, and um, cute pictures of sheep. I always have to throw in a few. <laughs> uh, and interactions. These were some kids that we worked with from inner city San Francisco. We could come out to the ranch and maybe for the first time in their life actually have interactions with animals other than dogs or cats. And that's important, I think, for our emotional health as well. Um, we need to do the research and get the data because data drives policy. So this was a transect we set up on our land to see if we could actually document some of the impact of the grazing. Uh, we obviously need safe, renewable energy sources. Uh, I'd like to throw this in because show that this is not new. These are windmills in Holland that are grinding pigments um, that ground the pigments that Rembrandt used 400 years ago. Uh, but it can be very new. This is a solar water pump in Tamara. Uh, you know, different forms of transport. This is the parking lot in Amsterdam at the railway station. And to localize. Uh, this is an agroponico in Cuba, a place in the outskirts of Havana where they grow fruits and vegetables because um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Cuba lost its oil imports and it also lost its exports and um, no longer had the ability to transport food and energy all around the world. It realized it had to localize and find other ways to move food around. Um, this is a project in London, uh, a transition town project. Trans transition towns are um, a way of organizing your community to use the resources we have right now um, to create the resources we need for a lower fossil fuel future. And here in Crouch End, which is a neighborhood of London, uh, there is this grocery store that sells what they call food from the sky, uh, which is grown on this garden on the roof of the grocery store. So I love this because it just doesn't get much more local than that. So in urban areas, again, the community gardens, thinking about ways that we can relocalize um, our food supplies, our you know, all of our basic needs, instead of having to transport them all over the world on a lake of artificially cheap fossil fuels, you know, how do we reroute back again into communities, um, which involves trying new things. <laughs> and thinking about community, in some sense, maybe community is the antidote to climate change. Uh, this is City Repair in Portland, Oregon, where they've done these great projects of um, taking intersections and turning them into gathering places. Um, here they've got a little tea station at the bottom where someone always keeps hot water and you can get a cup of tea anytime you want. Uh, they've got this little tea wagon that can go around the city and spread its wings and create shelter. Uh, this is another one they did with the sunflower as its pattern. And it's the idea that, you know, our urban cities are not designed in ways to bring people together. You know, an indigenous village always has a center and has a, a kind of heart and a gathering space at its center. And a lot of our urban cities are designed more on the plan of a Roman army camp. Um, 
you know, for conquest, but not for connection. And so to take that and transform that and rebuild spaces to connect. And to create rituals and celebrations. So to make these changes, there are many niches that we have to fill. Um, the resistance and the pro protest um, is really vitally important. We have to stand up against some of these things and stop the damage. Uh, these are uh, indigenous women on the front lines of the struggle from the Yucatan Peninsula, some of the Zapatista women struggling against globalization. I love this picture, right? <laughs> Uh, and these are some pictures from some of the actions that we've done, um, again, around globalization, around climate change, trying to bring some of that sacred celebration, doing a spiral dance, uh, you know, in the middle of an action. Uh, this was actually in Quebec City. Uh, from the FTAA back in 2001, where we found ourselves spiral dancing with the tear gas flying over our heads. Um, but there's a way in which I think our protest is always stronger if we can bring into it the vision of what we want. Uh, so we've got to, again, stop that destruction, um, but also speak for what we want. This is an Idle No More demonstration in San Francisco. Um, but I think one of the powerful things in some of the movements around climate change that are led by indigenous people is the idea of calling ourselves water protectors, land protectors, rather than protesters, and saying protect grandmother earth. You know, saying that water is sacred, water is life, speaking about what we want and what we believe. Uh, and this was in Cancun um, when the WTO met there, literally tearing down the barricades. And this is from Standing Rock four years ago, which was one of the great times that people came together and to try to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline. And it was a very powerful experience for me um, to come into this space. This is one of the beautiful elders there, Cheryl Angel, who's speaking to us. Um, because all of my life I've been sort of saying, like, we have to bring together the spiritual and the political. We can't separate them. Our political, you know, choices come from our understanding of what's sacred. And to come into that camp at San Standing Rock and the sign on the front said, you are entering a place of prayer and ceremony. And to just go, whoa, yes, right. And finally, we need hope and vision. We need to know what these policies are that can bring about the change so we can advocate that for them. We need to inspire people. Um, you know, again, we've just seen with our elections here in the US, people have been activated and mobilized as never before. Thousands and thousands of people have done things like made calls, um, volunteered to be poll watchers, uh, sent texts and postcards, people who have never been involved in the political process at all, and people like myself who've been involved in multiple ways over you know, decades. And if we could mobilize that kind of energy around climate change and climate activism, then we can transform the world. Uh, so cherish the sacred in all. Okay, and I think I'm probably over time, so I'm going to stop now.
It's not a problem. Thank you so much, Starhawk. I feel like you both have given us so much to think about, and I love that you both outlined, um, you know, sort of alternative visions for us to think about, but then also provided, you know, tangible, concrete things for us to take up to put those visions into practice. Um, so we have a whole whack of questions uh, in the Q&A. I doubt we're going to get through all of them. I'm going to do my best to parse them together. Um, so we have about half an hour for questions. Um, so maybe I'll just start off with a bit of a, a general question for, for both of you. Um, so I think, Christine Starhawk, you both in different ways spoke of the need to sort of unlearn and, and relearn, to kind of reframe our understanding of the world, the role of indigenous peoples, our understanding of the climate, the earth, um, and then also the need for sort of regeneration. You know, so Starhawk, you spoke of sort of permaculture as a frame to do that. Christy, you spoke of land back as a frame. And so I guess the question is, on the one hand, how do we counter the narratives that run opposite to these framings? Um, and then how do you think people, what is the process through which people change their beliefs? What can we do to kind of support that transformation, that process of kind of unlearning and relearning? Um, Christy, do you want to go first? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, I've really been pondering that again, especially in the last couple of weeks since our election. Um, because even though we did succeed in getting rid of the orange guy right, and getting uh, electing Biden and Harris, um, we have to contend with the fact that something like 70 million people voted for Trump in spite of all of the damage he's done, in spite of uh, the worst levels of corruption and just real wrongdoing, uh, in spite of the, him being completely unfit uh, for office and completely mismanaging everything from... Um, you know, COVID to everything else, you know, how do we reach these people and how do we talk to them and what is really going on with them? And I can't honestly say that I know, um, but I do think my suspicion is that there's something about Trump and uh, the right-wing populism, which is seen in an upsurge all over the world, that basically they are telling people things that make them feel good in the short term. Um, you know, it, it's like we've probably all done that. You know, you get a piece of bad news and it's much easier to push it away. You know? Like I myself am prone to believe that if I just don't ever check the oil in my pickup truck, uh, I won't ever have to worry about whether it has oil or not. You know? I know that doesn't work so well in the long run, but any given, you know, time I stop at the gas station, it's easier not to check the oil than it is to check it, because I don't like checking it, right? Um, and it's harder to be the ones to tell people the bad news, and especially to tell people bad news that maybe makes them feel bad about themselves, even when they should feel bad about themselves. So we have to figure out figure that out and i think part of it is the framing again around climate change um you know rather than saying like you're bad and wrong and greedy for wanting to drive your car or do what you do we need to find a way to say to people hey um there are ways that we can deal with this problem that are actually you know, going to make our lives better. And we need you to be part of that. You know, if you're an oil and gas worker, we actually need your experience and your expertise. Um, I don't think everyone needs to say that. I mean, I think in some ways when people say, what can white people do in the movement? Maybe that's what we can do, right? Uh, if we come from a place of privilege, 
you know, maybe we're the ones to have to speak to other people of privilege and try to figure out this way of shifting and changing them. Because often the people have been so impacted by these things, just don't have the residual energy. They need that energy for their own communities and just to, you know, further the resilience in their own communities. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. How do we frame our messages and invite people into the great adventure of changing this world uh, rather than just telling them they're bad and wrong, even when they are bad and wrong? Um, <clears throat> that's a really good answer. <laughs> So there's a, there's a number of things that I think about. Uh, I think about just going off of what you said last uh, is, is the energy that it takes black and brown people and indigenous people to have to counter some of the um, arguments, questions, dialogue from non-indigenous people is frankly exhausting. And, you know, we are in the process of trying to reclaim and uh, working on revitalization of our own communities, our, our languages, our land-based practices, all of that, the attention that our young people and the next generations need within our community requires 110% of our, our energy. And, and they deserve it. And, and the problem that we're facing is that we have to be a historian, we have to be an environmentalist, we have to be, a, you know, we have to be a land-based practitioner, we've got to be, you know, uh, <laughs> we've got to know geography, we have to, we have to be lawyers, you know, just to exist as Indigenous people, we've got to fulfill all of these roles and we have to be experts at them all, just to be able to have a basic conversation. And that is really tiring and not a lot of people can do it all the time. And there's a lot of burnout in our communities because the people who are taking on the roles of climate leaders are few and far between. And we can't fight the trolls and the haters and the, thing, the people like that. What we need, we're, we're outnumbered. We need non-native people, white people, to fight other white people when it comes to um, dismantling the systems of racism and coming to, a, a, you know, challenging some of the thoughts around indigenous people and the realities that we live and so the racism really needs you know white people go collect your own people you know that's mm -hmm. what we need and that would really help a lot like that would just help a lot don't ask indigenous people to do the work for you when you can google it yourself when you can do the work for yourself don't ask indigenous people to provide free labor for you when you can do it yourself secondly that what I was thinking was, you know, just in terms of, there's this wonderful documentary I watched, uh, uh, I don't know where, <laughs> just years ago I watched it, and I don't know why it was, just happened to be on, but it, it was really interesting. It was this group of deer that were in a field, and the, the, the people that were studying them, taking the film, had supposed that, that it, because this deer, had to make a decision to leave this field and go to a watering hole for the winter and there was one of three watering holes within the vicinity and the people studying this group of deer thought that it would be the head male deer mm -hmm. that would ultimately make the decision and then all the other deer in the in the herd would follow to whatever was decided by this head male deer of, of the of the herd, I want to say is the of the tribe, <laughs> of, the, of the herd, and uh, and then what happened though, which surprised them, and and I thought was fascinating, was that at the time when it was time to leave, all of the deer began to look up, and they began to turn one way or the other, and they began to look in different directions until there was fifty one percent. Hmm. of the deer faced one direction and then the other 49 turned and walked with the 51 percent hmm. into that direction and they had made their decision collectively 
you know, sometimes we don't need to bring everybody along. We just mm -hmm. need to get enough people. So when we focus on the inspiring stories, like what you shared, Starhawk, like all of those positive things that are already happening around the world um, towards, uh, you know, food sovereignty, food security, climate change, um, you know, carbon sinks, all of those things that are happening are happening on the smaller community scale. When we connect with people in our communities, you know, connecting with people and organizing with people is one of the most important things. We just have to get to that 51%. That's, mm. you know, there's always going to be people who enjoy violence, who enjoy hatred, who enjoy the thrill of the vortex of of negative politics there's always going to be people who enjoy those things they get off on them they like them they're assholes you know and there's always going to be assholes it, i we don't have to convince them we just have to make it so that it's it's irrefutable the direction that the people want to take and then they will come along because in the end they are fence sitters you know mm -hmm. so this is this is what i what i think about in terms of what is the messaging and and all of that it's really vitally important to teach children at a very young age how to be respectful of the earth how to understand that plants are alive that they have their own spirit that they have a right to live it's very important to teach children at a very young age to love and be gentle with each other with animals and to see the earth in these in these ways the education system dominates our children's lives to the point where we we have to teach them these things on a part-time basis in our spare time so the more that we can have forest schools the more that we can support indigenous people who want to educate their own uh, youth on the land um, to find ways to to financially support those people so that they can do it we have to you know just continue our messaging of this of positivity around what is possible and to keep the hope alive and it is not all doom doom and gloom all, all the time although that we see the we see the destruction that should motivate us to do the things that are positive with others that are like-minded mm. Thank you both. Um, okay, this next question uh, is specifically for uh, Starhawk. Um, and so uh, ecofeminism is obviously, you know, a thread through so much of your work um, and was certainly sort of um, below the surface in a lot of what you said, uh, but you didn't uh, name it explicitly in your, in your presentation very much. And so um, the question is, can you tell us a bit more about how ecofeminism sort of is a thread in your worldview and kind of connects to um, the, the vision you were presented with us and some of the, the examples that you shared with us? Yeah, uh, ecofeminism was a term we started using, I think back in the early 80s, um, out of the recognition kind of that um, the way we view and treat the earth was very similar to the way we view and treat women and the way we view and treat people of color and indigenous people that this was all like one interlocking system. It wasn't a separate issue of, you know, women's rights, earth rights, you know, indigenous rights, racism that it was all one system that worked together as a system of oppression and then it needed to be countered as one system um, to transform it into something else. So we talk about, just like we talk about raping the earth or we talk about, um, you know, the abuse of our natural resources in the same way we might do that to another human being um, and um, that the counter had to be again not just you know purely party politics or instrumental politics but it had to be a shift in our whole way of thinking um, to really look at the world as a set of relationships Again, you know, that's what we hear over and over again from indigenous people, Lakota, let's say, Homa, 
all my relations you know that it's all about the relationships not about the isolated elements of things and I think that, um, you know, it kind of goes with what we were talking about and thinking about how it is, you know, one thing is to, you know, how do we get across to white folks that they, we really have a stake in ending white supremacy, um, not just to be good to other people, but because it's bad for us. You know, how do we get across to men that they have a stake in undermining male supremacy. Um, again, not just to be nice to those little women, but because it's bad for everyone, uh, because it constricts all of us into gender roles and things that don't really serve us. And, you know, I think there, there's a number of good arguments for that. Uh, one is that these systems prevent us from seeing what's actually, you know, harming us. From what's actually, you know, where our real, actual enemies are. Right? That, uh, you know, it may not be like the young black cat kids swaggering down the street that we should be afraid of. It might actually be the white guy in his nice business suit that actually is doing real harm to our livelihood and our health and our choices in life. Um, it also keeps us from actually connecting to good parts of ourselves, our own roots, you know, white folks were indigenous at one point. We were all indigenous at some point, you know, to somewhere. And we all have ancestors somewhere, if we go back far enough, that knew how to live with the land and that were very much shaped and connected integrally to a place and that understood the sacredness of nature and that had values that came from that. And many of us have lost those roots and those connections. Um, European ancestry folks, you know, have a history of resistance to oppression that goes back thousands of years through sets of peasant rebellions. <laughs> that happened over and over and over again in Europe. You know, a couple summers ago, I was teaching in Germany and I happened to be at a place um, in Germany right when Charlottesville happened and there were actual Nazis marching in the U.S. And for me, you know, com coming from Jewish heritage, there was something really deeply ironic and unsettling about being in Germany while Nazis were marching in the U.S. <laughs> um, the president was talking about good people on both sides. And the place that I was at in Germany was a hillside where in 1525 there was a huge peasant rebellion um, and the leaders of it stood on that hillside and watched as down below in the valley uh, the troops came in and destroyed their homes and destroyed their families and they lost that rebellion which pretty much happened with every peasant rebellion up until something like the French Revolution. It's not a happy history, but it's one of tremendous like um, resistance and persistence. And it's also a place where in the town below, the last witch in Germany was burned. And the witch persecutions in Europe were very much part of stamping out of that old indigenous consciousness of making people feel deeply uneasy and uncomfortable and untrustworthy of their own heritages of healing and herbal knowledge. And it was a place where um, an area that was known for growing flax uh, and making linen and had prospered doing that until in the 1800s, um, 
the linen trade was destroyed by cheap cotton coming from the U.S. that was produced so cheaply because it was produced with slaves and the people were starving and the story is somebody went across the hills to the Alps learned how to make cheese brought it back and they were able to shift to you know raising cows and making cheese and found a different way but I thought it was really interesting intersection to really recognize like none of these things are separate right the things that we do have an impact and um, if we allow ourselves to go down this easy route of saying like oh my problems are all that person over there and that group over there you know kill them get rid of them we lose the richness of our own history and our own heritage and finally I think we have a stake in countering these systems because these systems are really awful nasty things and they create awful nasty overarching ways of living and being that really aren't good for any of us <laughs> and um, if we stand up and fight against them we have the opportunity of really creating a world that ultimately is going to work so much better for everybody so I guess for me that's part of how I try to talk about it to other people who come from some level of privilege you know to say you have privilege doesn't mean your life is wonderful and happy you know and everything's good for you you can have a level of have privilege in some areas and still be like completely miserable in every other area <laughs> um, it just means you have like a benefit that maybe other people don't and you know maybe that benefit is something you'll never notice because it's all about what doesn't happen to you you know you go to the store and nobody follows you around and looks at you suspiciously you know um, you drive down the street cop pulls you over tells you you got a tail light out gives you a minor ticket and you drive off and nobody shoots you right you know um, and sometimes that privilege is actual benefits and advantages that maybe if you give them up you feel like you're losing something or you're threatened but on balance again if we can dismantle the nasty awful systems we live under we can create a world I think that is relational um, and again that is a beautiful world that all of us can thrive in Thank you, Starhawk. Um, this next question is uh, for you, Christy. Um, and so um, in your talk, uh, you didn't talk a lot about um, your art and your art practice, but we certainly saw um, you know, some of your art and paintings on, on, the, on the slides. Um, and so the question is, can you just talk a little bit about how you relate your art practice to you know, the environmental and climate justice issues uh, that you work on and kind of your, your climate justice work? Um, <clears throat> thanks. I think for me, uh, most of my art, uh, or it has its, its beginnings in the art that you see behind me here. So uh, this is my celebration of the plant world. It's uh, <clears throat> there's different species coming out of one stem to relay the interconnectedness of everything. There's roots that are shown to uh, signal that we have more to this life spiritually than what we see on the surface and that there's a great amount of, uh, of life that is sustained on the planet from what happens in the soil. Um, the little stars that are there speak to the spirituality and the spirits that surround us at all times. Um, and the plants are great teachers and they're very generous uh, beings. They just give and give and give, and they never ask for anything in return. And um, 
you know, they are very much equal to us as, as, uh, as living beings on this planet. And if all we ever did was praise them for, for our existence, we would be much better off. So I really like the idea of worms are sacred because I certainly believe that. And I believe, uh, like my friend uh, Isaac always says, is he, we, we need to re reimagine or I suppose reassess our measures of success. And drinking water from a river uh, with a cup that you can dip in just into the river without a water treatment plant is actual success. And we need to obtain the simpleness of going back to our uh, earth-based measures of success, which are basically that we survive, that we have health, and, um, and that we can live off of the land and live what we live off of less. So we're on computers. I like my iPhone like anybody else. I'm a little bit addicted to it. And, you know, like, the, but are these things worth it for me to give up? And I would say in a heartbeat, you know, they are. Uh, would I give up acrylic painting so that, and then perhaps just focus on quill work and beadwork and working on tanning hides, things that are sustainable? And, you know, the, the answer is yes, and I might yet do it. And, um, you know, there's, there's things that we can, we can do in our lives. And, and for me, paintings are an expression of my deep love and awe of this amazing planet that we are just blessed to have a little blip of life to live on, you know, you know, what is life? Yeah, that's what the Crowfoot said. What is life? It is the flash of a firefly. It is the shadow that dances across the grass and disappears. You know, this is, this, we're just given a very short little blip here. And so the, that's what my paintings are. Now in terms of the more, um, the paintings and, the, and the, the banners and things that you've seen across the different water and land protection actions across North America that Isaac and I have produced, we've produced about 10,000 or more. We've given them out for free. We lend our, we have our art, um, that those banners are all copyright release free. We just put them out into the world. Anybody can use them to raise funds for their own water and land protection action, you know, events that they're trying to organize. Um, we, like, we don't care. We just put them out there and we said, just use them. Don't even ask permission. Don't give us any credit. Just use them. You know, we're in this movement together. This is an environmental movement. It's an environmental justice movement. It's a, it's a, uh, movement against white supremacy. It's a movement to destroy, not destroy, but replace capitalism with something that isn't destructive. And these these things are important for us to think about this. I mean, I often say that there's no good revolution without rev good revolutionary art. And the thing about revolution is that it doesn't come free or cost free uh, without risk and um, without you know suffering and so the question is is how do we get to a place that does not uh, have bloodshed you know we're looking we're talking about the why the rise of right-wing fundamentalism globally as starhawk was mentioning we're seeing the militarization of police forces everywhere being used against the citizens to protect industry and these are things that uh, us those of us who who don't agree with those things need to begin to stand up against in a very strong, organized, strategic way, uh, rather than just taking to the streets and and screaming and yelling and and uh, there's I mean that is definitely important. It is important to protest. It is important to have your voice heard. But make no mistake, they're organizing on the other side. So on the fundamentalist right-wing side, they are busy organizing. They are organizing in private. They are training. They are doing all of these things. And what are we doing? You know, uh, because if we don't do something, we're going to be overrun and it's going to catch us off guard. So, you know, there are things that we need to think about doing. Uh, and what, what those things are, I don't know. I'm just a painter. I'm an artist. I'm a gardener. <laughs> I'm a high tanner. I'm a language learner. You know, and that, that's where my heart is. I'm, I'm not a 
I, I don't have any training in uh, arms. I don't know how to do that stuff. It doesn't, it's, not, it's not where I'm at. But I do believe in radical change. And I believe that whether we like it or not, the time upon us is upon us for that radical change. And it is going to require us to, as I said before, unite. So art can be used in a variety of ways. Um, I donate uh, a lot of like all the copyright release fees that, that I get paid for like, I don't know, people use my art for book covers and things like that. It, it all goes to the our language camp. Um, a, a great deal of our art that Isaac and I do in terms of murals, like we will go do a mural just so that we can have funds to like help build the language camp. Um, we also raise funds for others that are on the front lines of, of uh, water and land defense. So we're like constantly doing our art and then fundraising for them. It really feels like we're in a movement of, um, of community. And because of technology, we're able to connect with, with people more easily and support people who are trying to do these things. So art plays a very big role in also being able to um, give a voice to those who need it in the sense of it creates a unified voice for things so when there's people uh, carrying banners that, that are saying water is life it's very it's a very powerful you know it's very powerful to see a whole group of people s declaring that water is life and and uh, you know and this and water has no flag water has no no race it knows no race so when we say water is life it's it gets down to the fundamental essence of who we are as human beings. And this gives us a common, a common theme, a common banner under which we can unite and, and fight for the earth. I hope that answers the question. I don't even know what the question was. I kind of lost track. <laughs> no, you did. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, so we are quickly running out of time and I want to be respectful um, to our speakers and not um, take them more than we promised. So I'm going to try and squeeze in one last question um, and try to cobble together um, a few similar questions that were, that were asked. Um, so there were a few questions um, asking questions about um, sort of international struggles and international connections and solidarities. Um, and so for either of both of you, um, to what degree do you think it's important to be making, you know, international transnational connections and building that solidarity? recognizing that many of the, the climate struggles we're facing, you know, cut across borders, cut across continents, um, and the importance of movements also um, cutting across borders uh, as well, and perhaps even, you know, deconstructing the very notion of borders and states um, as part of that process. I think it's very important to have those international connections. Um, for one thing, we can really learn from other people's struggles and other people's formulations and uh, strategies and tactics. Uh, I know when we were in Quebec City for the Free Trade Area of the Americas protests back in 2001, um, we were very influenced by the struggle in Bolivia and by the Zapatistas, but in Bolivia there had been struggles for many years against um, the water privatization that was going on there. And they had come up with a beautiful declaration uh, that talked about, you know, how all human, everyone has a right to water. Uh, that water should be under the control of communities, that water should never be privatized. Um, it was much more poetic than I'm framing it now, um, but it was really an indigenous sensibility, and we were inspired by it, so we decided we would take that. We had it on the scroll, and our attempt was to bring it into the conference, which, of course, we couldn't get into because they had blockaded off all of Quebec City, uh, like a medieval fortress. But that was, you know, what influenced us. And um, I was glad Christy spoke about Evo Morales getting back into power in Bolivia and how 
people were able to resist that coup because that's also a great inspiration. Uh, and I think that our work and our communities and our, though I hate to use the word resources, right, can also be helpful to people in other areas and other struggles. And um, I'll just tell one quick little story. After Standing Rock, again, when I was teaching in Germany, one of our translators was saying how people all over Germany had organized to help support the actions there. And, um, and then she went home in her little town, they were talking about it and they were saying like, well, we're supporting the actions there, but what about our own rivers? You know, our own river is pretty dirty. Maybe we should become protectors of our own rivers as well. And they started a group called River Keepers to start actually cleaning up their own waters. And I think that's the kind of impact. Sometimes we may never know the impact that we have. But when we're thinking across those lines of struggle, um, again, when we're recognizing that what happens to someone in another part of the world is also connected to what happens to us, then we can build the counter globally, you know, to the rise of that right wing fascism with a much more hopeful rise of connection and solidarity and standing up for justice. Yeah, I agree. Tear down the walls, pull down all the flags. <laughs> we are one planet, we are one species, and we are, it's important that we, that we just start to think like that. You know, I really, I really see that. I, I don't see borders. I don't see, um, I see people and I see species and I see water and water is, is the lifeblood of mother earth. And we need to do everything we can in our power to protect water for the future generations. And, um, you know, I just want to say that I'm really honored to be on this uh, panel this evening. I thank you all. Uh, everybody who tuned in and those who are still still on online, uh, thank you, Starhawk, for being you know so beautiful in your ways and sharing so openly. And uh, thank you, Julie and Amanda, for for hosting us. And uh, I don't really have anything more to say. Just uh, good night to everybody, and I really appreciate being here. I also want to say thank you and. I really appreciate it, really uh, so happy to have had the experience of getting to listen to you, Christy, and see your incredibly beautiful artwork. Uh, it's really just filled my heart tonight. So I thank you all for inviting me to this. And, uh, you know, um, I do teach courses in permaculture. We also are going to be starting our program in regenerative land management next year through Earth Activist Training. People can reach me through my website, which is starhawk.org or earthactivisttraining.org. Um, we've offered scholarships for indigenous and people and people of color. Um, we have great student teacher from Standing Rock Reserve who's now doing some incredible projects there. And um, we really welcome participation. And, you know, the, the one strange gift of this terrible COVID time is it's allowed us to develop these online connections and made it possible for people to connect with these things all over the world. So um, there are those opportunities and I'm grateful to be part of this.
Well, we are so incredibly grateful uh, to both of you, Christy and Starhawk, that you were able to join us this evening. Um, I think you really helped to, to ground and situate um, the next couple of days that we're going to have throughout uh, the symposium. So thank you again uh, so much to both of you. Um, I can see tons of comments in the chat um, of participants sharing um, their thanks for, for spending some time with us. Uh, so with that, I will wish everyone uh, a wonderful evening, a wonderful uh, next few days and weekend. Um, and I hope that some of you will join us uh, for subsequent sessions of the symposium um, tomorrow and Saturday. So thank you everyone again, uh, and we'll talk soon.